Okay. Welcome. Um, just note, uh, this is not a webinar. Uh, we've all had enough of, of the glut of webinars since COVID hit us. This is just a law reports editor. That's me with veteran advocate uh, Johan Moorcroft uh, having coffee while we chat about summary judgment and the amended Rule 32. I'm uh, Louis Pavilski, and uh, I've spent uh, many years with Deuter and in Lexis in law reports, and now I'm providing um, an affordable case law service, uh, Louis Case Law, and I'm, I'm really lucky to spend almost all my time reading case law. And, and one of the issues that I keep seeing across my desk is summary judgment and the, this amended Rule 32. So I reached out to Johan and he kindly agreed to give us his thoughts and expertise and wealth of experience. Johan is a practicing advocate in Johannesburg where he did pupillage uh, 25 years ago. And he's the author of uh, LexisNexis publications, uh, Banking Law and Practice, and three um, of the legendary law titles, um, Currency and Banking, Loan and Negotiable Instruments. He um, fancies himself as a writer, and in practice he focuses on civil and commercial law, and his hobbies are photography, traveling, reading, and motorcycling. So Johan, um, Basically, we have default judgment where the defendant fails to defend the action. And then we have summary judgment where the defendant does defend and oppose the judgment, but does not have a genuine or sustainable defense. Thank you, Louis. And thank you for inviting me to this talk. Uh, through your efforts, you've done a great deal to make case law front and center in the legal discussion, and I think that is a very good thing. Uh, the summary judgment procedure have been in our courts for more than a century. It came from England originally, and the purpose is to give judgment in favor of a plaintiff and the circumstances where the defendant does not have a bona fide defense. In certain instances, like a liquid document, a liquidated claim, a claim for delivery of movable property, and for ejectment. So it's only in those circumstances that one um, can get that judgment. Johan, um, you know, I, I have to read a lot of cases uh, to cherry pick the good ones that, that I share. And, and a lot of the defenses I see, they, they seem to be really far-fetched and, and almost desperate attempts uh, merely to delay. And, and some of them try to drag up as many possible defenses as possible as seemingly in the hope that just one of them will stick. Yes, and the purpose of the procedure is to weed out the cases where there really is no defense and then give leave to defend in the cases where there is a, a good defense or arguable defense. And those cases then proceed to, to trial. And of course, the advantage to the system is the courts are not clogged up. The plaintiff who has an, an answerable case gets, gets uh, early in the proceedings. And uh, it's also important to note that the, the concept um, is constitutional. And that was decided by the Supreme Court of Appeal in the Jupe Investments case. Uh, the reference, anybody's interested, 2009 bracket 5 SA1, Supreme Court of Appeal decision. And in that case, his lordship, Mr. Justice Nafsa, said the rationale for summary judgment proceedings is impeccable. The procedure is not intended to deprive a defendant with a tribal issue or a sustainable defense of his or her day in court. And that is the, the starting point in any summary judgment application. Ah, um, yeah, I, I confess, uh, Judge Nafs is uh, one of my favorites. Um, you know, um, in, in 2019, um, there were some fundamental changes introduced. And after that, we saw judgments talking about this amended Rule 32. Yes. Um, Johan, can you tell us about those changes? Yes, well, Louis, the, the changes came into effect in the High Court on 1 July 2019, 
So there have been a few cases now uh, dealing with this in the Magistrates Court on 9 March 2020. It's also almost two years ago now. Now, the fundamental change is that whereas in the past, the plaintiff would serve its uh, summons with the particulars of claim normally, the defendant would enter appearance to defect, uh, to defend, did I say defect, <laughs> to defend, and thereafter the plaintiff would seek summary judgment by way of affidavit and the notice seeking summary judgment. So it was decided without reference to the defendant's plea, but on the basis of the affidavit by the plaintiff and the affidavit by the defendant. Under the revised rule, the defendant is now obliged to file a plea. The plaintiff, when reading the plea, is now informed what, what the defense is, and he then deposes to an affidavit dealing with the, the issues in the plea and telling the court or the reader why there is no real triable issue. In other words, the defenses raised in the plea are not, are not uh, shouldn't be considered by, by the court. Um, in the past, the plaintiff had to say that in his opinion, or her opinion, there was no bona fide defense. And that was because the plaintiff didn't have the defendant's plea. Now the plea is available uh, and it carries on after that stage with the two affidavits. And um, Johan, uh, what would you say are, are the practical implications uh, of, of the amended rule? Well, the, what immediately comes to, to mind is the fact that the plaintiff, when dealing with a plea in his or her affidavit, can only deal with what is actually pleaded by the defendant. One cannot obviously not expect the plaintiff to deal with issues not raised by, by the defendant. Uh, previously, what often happened was that a defendant would raise issues in the plea in its uh, affidavit resisting summary judgment, but then in the plea, those, those defenses would fall by the wayside. Now the horse is in front of the cart, like a rear wheel drive car, and that is no, no longer possible. Now, obviously, in, in its plea, the defendant would plead the facta probanda, the facts necessary to prove its defense. It cannot and should not go into the evidence of, of the defense. Um, and similarly, the plaintiff, in the particulars of claim, would, would plead the facta probanda that supports its claim and not, not the evidence, the facta probantia, as Latin speakers like to call it, that, that proves uh, uh, the case. And one shouldn't, one shouldn't uh, deal with the, with the evidence in pleadings. And I can perhaps refer you to the Ascendus case, Animal, Ascendus Animal Health, PDI Limited versus Merck Sharp and Dome, 2020, bracket one is a 327 constitutional court case in support of that important statement. Now, of course, in the affidavit, dealing with the, the, the claim and the defense, the plaintiff and the defendant will plead evidence as well. For the simple reason that the affidavit constitutes a pleading of sorts, as well as the evidence to substantiate those facts. And the defendant is not required, and this is very important, not required to, to prove its defense. What it must do is it must lay a, lay a basis for the court to find that there are issues for trial. And that, is, that has always been the law. Uh, in the Tubalen case, the reference there is 2020 bracket 6 SA 624. Mr. Justice uh, Bins Ward said, uh, a defendant is not required to show that its defense is likely to prevail. If a defendant can show that it has a legally cognizable defense on the face of it, and that the defense is genuine or bona fide, summary judgment must be refused. So, um, Johan, 
Um, just, just give me, I just want to get it. Is, are there any implications for the onus with the new rule? Does anything shift to the defendant? No, the rule does not cast an onus on the defendant. Mm -hmm. uh, the onus is, is allocated according to the usual legal principles. The uh, normal rules apply. And in most cases, the onus will be on the plaintiff to, to prove its case. So it is misleading perhaps to, to, show, to show or to say that a defendant must, must prove a defense. It need not do so, it must raise a tribal issue. And that is a question that the, uh, uh, the court must decide. But the important implication here is really that uh, the defendant in order to be bona fide should restrict its affidavit to the issues pleaded in the, in the plea. Because if it pleads one version of fact in the plea and completely different defenses in the affidavit, one cannot really say that the defense is bona fide. And as you know, a cornerstone of summary judgment, the old Breitenbach versus Fiat case, um, the defense must be bona fide as well. So, so you understand, say, say I'm the defendant, and um, I do want to raise new defenses, and, and I am bona fide in doing so, then uh, what, what should I do? Well, the rule doesn't really deal with that. Mm -hmm. Rule 28 of the uniform rules, we're talking about the high court practice. Now the lower court practice is in broad terms similar. In terms of rule 28, a party can at any time give notice of its intention to amend the pleading. If the other party, the opposing party objects, then the matter can be argued. If not, the, the amendment is effected. Now if, and this can happen quite easily where a defendant files a plea, there's an application for summary judgment, at which time perhaps the defendant go see a new attorney or somebody else gets involved and he gets advice that there's actually a defense that you've not pleaded. Now in that case, it would be very unfair to the defendant to hold him to the plea uh, and limit his affidavit uh, set out, setting out the defense to what he stated in the plea. And uh, there's authority that in such a case, what should happen is Rule 28 should be applied. The defendant should apply for leave to amend its the plea. And if the amendment is then granted, it can, of course, file an affidavit dealing with the defense setting out in the amended plea. Now, by that time, perhaps, actually quite likely, the plaintiff would have filed an affidavit asking for summary judgment. And it only makes sense that the plaintiff then be permitted to file a further affidavit by dealing only with the specific point raised by the amendment. Say, for instance, the defendant raises a prescription point in the affidavit resisting summary judgment that was not raised in the, in, in the plea. The plaintiff seeks summary judgment. The defendant now gets advised that there's a prescription point in, in your case. It should then be permitted to amend its plea and then elaborate on the prescription defense in the affidavit. But in such a case, of course, one will have to, in, in order to apply the alter alter partem rule, once you then give the plaintiff an opportunity to deal with that, that new defense in a further affidavit that limited only to, to that point. Oh, thanks, Johan. Um, just uh, the, the, the case that actually triggered uh, me being curious about this amended rule was the recent one uh, that we had in the Johannesburg High Court, um, Peterson versus Roman Pizza mm. Bockham. There, yes, um, yes. the plaintiff sought summary judgment for a rear rental, and they claimed that the defendant absconded from the commercial lease premises, but then defendant alleged there was a valid cancellation of the lease as a result of misrepresentation by the plaintiffs. Now, now plaintiffs raised some really interesting jurisdiction issues, which um, the judge dealt with, but the, the part that interested me was acting judge Frank discussed the amended rule 32 
and and he emphasized the reading in approach um, in his keyword somewhere at the top in, in the Tumalen case. Um, what, yes. what are your thoughts on this case and, and what is the reading in approach? Well, Judge uh, Frank referred to the judgment by Judge Bins Ward in the Tumalen case, uh, where he said that one should read the word genuinely into the rule so that the rule actually means or reads that the plaintiff is required to, and I quote, explain briefly why the defense as pleaded does not genuinely raise an issue for trial. And what was pointed out by, by Judge Vince Ward and again by Judge Frank was that this could perhaps be interpreted to mean that the plaintiff does not only have to show that there's no tribal issue, but has to convince the court that the plea is, uh, is actually acceptable. It does not raise a defense at all. And that is not the purpose. Uh, there's a separate rule, as you know, dealing with, with exceptions. Uh, and the rule 23, where a party alleges that on the face of a pleading, it does not disclose a defense or a claim. Summary judgment is a distinct procedure where a party tells the court, even though there's a defense pleaded, that defense does not have any merit. You should grant summary judgment in my favor. And by, by stressing the word genuinely, raise a uh, a defense as, as pleaded, the court made it very clear that one cannot expect the plaintiff to go beyond uh, dealing with the facts and make the allegation and convince the court that the pleading itself does not, does not raise a defense. And that was what, what both of those, those judges then stressed. Ah. Thank you, Johan. Um, no, I've, I've really gotten a better take um, on the amended rule now. You know, um, as a law reports editor, you skip like a stone on the surface of the law, you know, with just the reported cases that come along. There are so many of them. Yeah, yeah. We, it's just, just too many. And you get like a goldfish memory where it goes in and out again. Um, so there, there's actually some other legal issues I've noticed uh, crossing my desks. And, and I'm curious, do you have thoughts on? So... I'd love to us to have another chat like this, or, or actually a few more, um, in the new year. Um, That'll be fantastic. I will enjoy that. Thanks, Johan. I will um, enjoy that. And, and before we go, um, I noticed on your WhatsApp profile, there, there's a picture of, of a bike that I, that I know well. It's a Honda <laughs> VFR, which oh, is yeah. a V4, and it's got a very, very unique exhaust note. It's a real beauty of a sports bike. Um, is that actually yours? And, and do you ride it? Yeah, that's, that is my, my favorite possession, Louis. I've had it now for 10 years. I tend to keep bikes very long. And I really feel that life is not really worth living unless you have a V4 engine in your life. The V4 gives you the special note and a special sound, which, which I really enjoy. So I've had this bike now for 10 years. And I've had great, great fun with it. Ah, um, Johan, do, what do you do with it? Uh, do you, no, do you I, go on long distance or just uh, commuting? Uh, I'm curious. Well, I use it to commute sometimes, but I, what I really enjoy is doing long trips, uh, say down to Port Elizabeth or, or wherever, and riding with, with a few mates. The great thing about riding a bike is you can ride a bike and be on your own, in your own little cocoon. But when you stop for a, for a smoke break or, or a coffee, you have your friends and you can chat. So there's that duality almost that I really enjoy about, about biking. So I've had great fun biking. And also, of course, biking goes with photography. Of course, when you, when you enjoy photography, you, you have more to see when you, when you do biking as well. So, so that's been my hobbies now for many years. Oh, no, no, no. I hear you. I, I was also a biker for many, many years. Went to all I know, the rallies. I've, I've heard that, yes. Yeah, no, no. I actually did it as a, as a job as well. I, I was a motorcycle courier in the UK. And, and I oh, love yeah. it. And, and I totally get you about being in your own headspace, just you and inside the helmet. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 
I think I must go shopping uh, sometime next year. <laughs> <laughs> you must go for a ride together sometime, Louis. <laughs> yeah. That'll be great. That'll be great. All right. Thank you so much, Johan. And um, thanks, Louis. Yeah, we'll, I'm going to pick the next topic, and uh, yeah, I'll, right. I'll dock in your inbox um, very soon, and we'll we'll set it up for early next year. Thanks. I appreciate it. It's a great privilege to be involved. Thank you. Thank you. Johan. Thanks for the invite. Thanks for the Thank invite, you. Louis.